Um, okay, so um, these uh, two lectures that uh, first one I'll start uh, this morning uh, will be on the on the topic of time reversal symmetry breaking in unconventional superconductors, and uh, I will uh, emphasize optical effects. But in general, um, I want to point out that you know we've been hearing talks here, and you'll hear uh, talks uh, the rest of the week, um, which uh, uh, emphasize the, the uh, variety of, of, of topics associated with strongly correlated uh, uh, electron systems, uh, theory behind. Uh, what I will try to do in this talk, besides talking about the, the, uh, the effects uh, and, and the background for it, I will also uh, try uh, to, to emphasize the fact that many times uh, when you face a problem uh, to uh, experimentally to detect uh, an effect or to verify or to check uh, whether other measurements are correct or not, uh, you need to invent new ways of measurements. You need to invent new ways uh, where, where uh, they, they were not uh, done before. And many times uh, you come up with new instruments, new ways of measurement, uh, of measurements that, that uh, then uh, exceed sensitivity that, that uh, people have been used uh, to and, and uh, allow for new things uh, to do. So I will actually try to emphasize this uh, uh, as much, uh, as well as the uh, physics. Um, and and uh, uh, in particular, uh, you've been hearing theory talks, uh, Theorists like to say, oh, you know, we can uh, um, uh, sort things uh, using symmetry. Well, uh, I will try to show that, that you can do the same things uh, with experiment. You can invent new experiments that are based on, on symmetry. OK, so this was a background. So this uh, first lecture is going to be uh, on background concepts. And I will start from the very beginning. And, and really go to very basics, probably will remind you of, of uh, your uh, ENM classes and, and uh, um, et cetera, um, and, uh, and then uh, go further uh, to discuss the uh, more current uh, issues in the next, in the next le lecture. So uh, time reversal symmetry, well, uh, this is the uh, the way the physical laws uh, behave under the uh, time reversal transformation, t goes to minus t. Uh, time reversal operation, uh, operator uh, applied to the velocity uh, gets uh, get you to the uh, minus velocity. So if you apply it going uh, right, uh, you'll get now a runner uh, going to the left. Uh, this allows you also to uh, do the same for current. Current goes to the right. You apply the time reversal operator. You get now current goes to the left. Now, a pause uh, and something that, that has been an issue uh, between uh, uh, the, the um, theory, uh, high energy theory and, and condensed matter, uh, which is um, if you uh, go to, to, to the basics, yes, the, the so-called standard model, uh, as you know, the standard model uh, breaks time reversal uh, symmetry, um, and, and uh, uh, it does that uh, through the uh, weak interaction, which violates CP symmetry, uh, and this was discovered by uh, Corning and, and, and Fitch. Um, however, we remember that uh, the standard model may not be the ultimate theory. And if you go beyond the standard model, there are many options, one of which uh, could be that the so-called ultimate theory uh, does not break time reversal symmetry. In that case, time reversal symmetry in the standard model is going to be an emergent phenomenon. Why do I mention that? Well, first of all, uh, there have been debate 
uh, for many years between um, high energy physicists and, and condensed matter physicists on, on the, the fundamental versus emergent, well, there is still uh, a, a possibility that, that uh, uh, time over asymmetry breaking is an emergent phenomenon uh, in the standard model. And second, it's because in condensed matter physics, time over asymmetry breaking is always an emergent phenomenon. That is because if you start from the basic Hamiltonian of a solid, uh, it is basically uh, relies on electromagnetic interactions uh, between the ions and electrons. Uh, and uh, obviously, such a Hamiltonian does not break time reverse asymmetry. Time reverse asymmetry then appears uh, as an emergent phenomenon through uh, different types of physics. For example, uh, if magnetism appears uh, uh, below some energy scale, below some, some temperature, uh, then it is an, an emergent uh, phenomenon. So whenever we talk about time reverse asymmetry breaking in condensed matter physics, we are talking about uh, some emergent phenomenon, phenomenon, some low energy uh, physics uh, below the physics of the fundamental Hamiltonian uh, of the system. So this has to be kept in mind. So uh, going back to basics, if you start with the Schrod Schrodinger equation uh, and you apply the time reversal operator, uh, then uh, the condition for time reversal, uh, for time reversal symmetry to be uh, 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 satisfied is that yeah, you come back to the original Hamiltonian. And without any spin considerations, uh, as you all know, time reversal operator is simply the complex conjugation. You, know, you can see it immediately from the, from the Schrodinger equation. When you take the, the uh, 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 complex conjugation, uh, then uh, um, you'll get minus here, and it will come back uh, if h under the operation becomes, uh, comes back to h, you come back to the, same <coughs> to the same Hamiltonian, to the same Schrodinger equation. On the other hand, if you do have a uh, spin consideration, if there are uh, magnetic moments or spins in the, in the system, uh, then a uh, time reversal operator becomes uh, an anti-unitary operator, uh, which is a combination of the complex conjugation uh, and the spin rotation operator, okay? So this needs to be kept in mind. So, the simplest, uh, which is going to be very useful for uh, the, uh, uh, the talk later, uh, is uh, what happens to, to a plane wave of light that you are shining uh, on your sample. Um, suppose the light goes in the z direction, and you, uh, so the electric field is proportional to the e to the minus ikz. And if you apply the time reversal operator, since there is no spin consideration uh, within, with this uh, uh, beam of light, uh, you come back, okay? So applying the time reversal operator on beam going in the plus z give you now a beam of light coming back in the minus z direction. This is very simple, but as you will see, it is very deep and important uh, for understanding experiments. Okay, what happened uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, spin rotation? I think the easiest way to see it is in a, in a classical picture. Because in a classical picture, I know how to create a magnetic moment. I'll take a, a loop of current. The magnetic moment is simply the current uh, times the area enclosed by the loop, okay? And it's in the uh, direction which is perpendicular uh, to the loop. But uh, current, as you remember, if I apply the time reversal operator, get me, gets me the uh, uh, reverse direction of the current and the reverse direction of the current, therefore, is going to reverse the magnetic moment. So applying the time reversal operator on uh, a moment or on a spin gets me the spin in the opposite direction, uh, which is exactly applying this, this uh, uh, spin rotation uh, on, the, on that, on that uh, uh, magnetic moment. Well, obviously, if you have a ferromagnet, and you apply the time reversal operator, then you get a ferromagnet with uh, the moment pointing in the opposite direction, okay? 
Okay, so that's for time reversal uh, uh, operator. Now for unconventional superconductors. Well, as you we all know, we've seen it. Superconductivity is the phenomenon uh, that below a certain temperature, the resistance uh, goes to zero, identically to zero. Uh, and important also for this uh, talk is the Meissner effect that below uh, the critical temperature, uh, the, the, uh, below the superconducting transition, then magnetic field lines are going to be expelled from the interior uh, of the superconductor that is called the Meissner effect. Superconductivity, uh, can be, can, it's a thermodynamic uh, phase. It's a, the, it involves uh, uh, a thermodynamic transition uh, and, and, and other parameter uh, that can be described by the pair wave function that has an amplitude and has a phase. Uh, and in, in general, you go through the superconducting transition. Uh, you break, could be other uh, uh, symmetries as well, but at the minimum you break the U1 uh, gauge symmetry and uh, uh, um, you, you condense uh, uh, electrons into, into Cooper pairs. So uh, if I start now with a uh, pair wave function, uh, uh, which is uh, made with, with uh, uh, operators uh, that, that describe both the momentum uh, and the spin, uh, I can then uh, rewrite it in terms of the orbital part. Of course, there is the center of mass, uh, which I'm going to ignore, and then there is the orbital part uh, and the spin part. Uh, to, remi to remind you that the pair wave function symmetry is the same as the gap symmetry. Sometimes people use pair wave functions, sometimes people use the gap to describe the symmetry. Um, and um, obviously, since I need for any pair of electrons to uh, take care that, that the wave function will be uh, totally anti-symmetric under uh, particle exchange, uh, then if k goes to minus k, uh, then uh, s will go to s prime under, and, and there are two possibilities uh, uh, to do that. Um, I can have an even parity for the orbital part, um, and this can be described using angular momentum indices. So if the angular momentum index L is 0, 2, 4, that is, it's even, uh, then I get a spin uh, singlet, um, a spin singlet uh, uh, superconductor, or Cooper pair. Um, and if it's odd parity, that is L equal 1, sometimes people call it P wave, uh, equal 3, that's, that's uh, uh, F wave, I mean here uh, 2 is the D wave, uh, then we get a spin, uh, triple, uh, spin triplet uh, superconductor. Now, um, uh, even versus odd parity sometimes also uh, bring about different type of, uh, of order parameter that people use. Uh, so I, I'll just flash it briefly. I will come back to it uh, uh, if I'll have time uh, when I discuss uh, uh, specific models, uh, specific materials. Uh, but uh, even parity, spin singlet, uh, um, simply the, the gap function is, is, a, is a matrix with off diagonal uh, terms that have uh, the, the uh, delta like that uh, uh, with, with uh, 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 delta of k uh, uh, like that, where um, if you have a, a, an odd parity spin triplet, uh, then the other parameter can be described uh, with a vector, uh, and this is called the d-vector. I will not use it, uh, uh, at least not, not in the first lecture again, uh, so don't confuse d-vector with d-wave. Uh, d-wave is, is the L equal 2 uh, symmetry of the, of the angular momentum. Uh, it just happened that people have been using uh, d uh, to describe this director of the, uh, of the vector that, that is associated with the order parameter uh, of such superconductor. I will come back to it uh, when we talk specific examples. So some hallmarks and then classification of these superconductors. I said unconventional superconductors, uh, but obviously I need to distinguish conventional from unconventional. So um, in most classification, conventional superconductor, uh, superconductors are uh, uh, associated with uh, the, the, the BCS type 
superconductors for which the angular momentum is zero uh, uh, the, uh, in the center of mass of the, of the Cooper pair, and it's a uh, spin singlet superconductor. Such superconductors, uh, when it's, it's a perfect superconductor, of course, uh, uh, these are pairing of, of opposite momentum states, uh, but uh, in general, uh, it was shown by uh, Anderson that uh, uh, such a superconductor is basically pairing uh, uh, time-reversed states. Uh, and a hallmark of that is that if you average the wave function over the Fermi surface, uh, you get something which is finite. You have a gap everywhere on the, on the Fermi surface, uh, which therefore uh, scattering of, of uh, uh, electrons uh, um, in such a, in such, with non-magnetic uh, impurities uh, uh, is not doing much to the superconductor. Uh, this is called uh, the Anderson theorem. In fact, TC remains the same. Um, um, so TC, in fact, remains the same um, all the way to very, very close uh, to TC. Um, I don't have time uh, to, to talk about it uh, today, but uh, in the presence of non-magnetic uh, impurities, uh, then there is a criterion. That is the criterion that tells you when TC starts to change. Not the critical behavior, which is a mean field-like, as you all remember, but just TC. Uh, this is called the Braut criterion. Uh, and, and uh, well, if somebody will ask, I can talk about that, but otherwise um, it's very, very, still very, very close to TC for almost all uh, uh, standard superconductors uh, that Anderson theorem uh, is, is fulfilled. So opposite to that, unconventional superconductors uh, will be those that do have uh, internal structure in the, in the center of mass of the, of the Cooper pair, uh, L, the angular momentum, therefore, is, is uh, not zero. Uh, and uh, then um, many times uh, there are nodes. I mean, the, this is uh, a, a cartoon for uh, the uh, high TC superconductors, the D-wave superconductors. This, by the way, uh, does not break uh, time reversal symmetry. Uh, it is uh, simply uh, uh, a simple D-wave with a spin, spin singlet. Uh, but uh, if you average now the pair wave function uh, on the Fermi surface, you get zero. So many times this is used as the criterion between conventional and unconventional, although there are other criteria that people use, simply average uh, the pair wave function over the Fermi surface, whether you get zero or not. Now, uh, in general, when you talk about uh, superconductors, unconventional superconductors, those that, those that have uh, uh, internal structure in the, in the center of mass of the Cooper pairs, uh, then the key symmetries uh, are uh, time reversal and inversion symmetries. And these can be fulfilled or broken, and, and a variety of, of uh, uh, novel phenomena can appear in the superconducting state uh, as you analyze these, these symmetries. So today I will concentrate on time reversal symmetry, uh, inversion symmetry, uh, is also uh, very important, uh, and, and, uh, but it's not going to be the, uh, the main topic of today. I think that, that uh, um, in talks that involve um, uh, stripes, etc., you may have heard some uh, manifestations of this. Okay, so um, uh, I mentioned that, that this type of, uh, of uh, wave function does not break time reversal symmetry. It's a simple D wave uh, like for the cuprates. Um, and uh, is therefore, uh, as it is known, it's the dx squared minus y squared. However, if, for example, for some reason, in the center of mass, you will acquire an imaginary part, okay, like dxy, uh, which have been proposed uh, for, for quite a few systems, including uh, the cuprates in, in the early days, uh, then uh, obviously plus i dxy and minus i dxy are degenerate. As they are degenerate, 
uh, you have kind of angular momentum uh, that, uh, that on the average points one direction versus uh, the opposite direction. Uh, this, is, this reminds you already of, of like an icing system uh, and therefore time reversal symmetry uh, is broken. So whenever there is uh, a, a, an imaginary part, uh, then uh, this is a signature for time reversal symmetry breaking. I'll come back to it uh, in a minute. So if you uh, now, and again, a reminder, because I'm going to use it uh, later, uh, if you write the, the, the pair, uh, the, the gap function uh, in, in the normal way using the, the, the Fermi uh, functions uh, with this, the, the energy or, um, of the state, that's the gap, uh, then uh, in general, uh, you can write, uh, this is for the cases of, of uh, internal degrees, in, internal structure in the uh, pair wave function or in the gap function, uh, then there is going to be some amplitude, uh, which will represent really the size of the gap, which uh, is going to be associated also with TC of that superconductor. And then uh, you can have whatever there is in the internal structure, and if an imaginary part appears, uh, then it's going to be uh, a time reversal symmetry superconductor. Yeah? R? Yeah, then time reversal symmetry is broken. Right. Yeah, if it, yeah. Yeah, if it's only if I, and I'll actually I will even show an uh, example of that, uh, probably in the second lecture, uh, UPT3 has, a, has such, a, such a phase. Um, yes, obviously, um, um, but, but if it's just the, the imaginary part, I can always rotate it. <laughs> so, um, anyway, uh, so again, to emphasize the fact that high TC, uh, dx squared minus y squared, uh, can, the gap function can be written as cosine kx minus cosine ky, and this does not break time reversal symmetry. Uh, usually, uh, when time reversal symmetry is broken, then uh, there is a tendency to gap the nodes. Okay. Now, um, a little bit of, of, uh, of history. Um, early searches for uh, time reversal symmetry breaking. So, uh, in fact, time reversal symmetry breaking in superconductors, uh, at least to my knowledge, uh, started with the proposal that high TC superconductors uh, exhibit anion superconductivity. Uh, this goes back to uh, 1987, uh, and in fact, uh, I think that one of the very early places where a possible anion superconductivity uh, was announced was here. There was a conference here uh, in Trieste. Uh, in 1987, I was here, which means I'm old. Um, and uh, um, uh, this uh, came uh, quite early in, in early papers of uh, uh, Vadim Kalmayer and Bob Laughlin, um, and then uh, uh, became a very uh, interesting uh, theory to discuss. Um, so the basic, uh, and again, I don't want to go too much into it, I mean, it goes way beyond uh, the uh, uh, just searching for time reversal symmetry breaking. Uh, but uh, the idea was to write a many, a, a many particle wave function uh, of, of the system. Uh, and then in exchanging two particles, of course, you acquire a phase, uh, which we know how to uh, uh, take care of in the, pres in, in, in the, in the case of uh, either bosons or fermions. If so, if I write the phase uh, that is acquired uh, as pi 1 minus 1 over nu, uh, then nu equal 1 is going to give me 0 here, and therefore it is, has to do with bosons. Uh, but if nu is equal to infinity, then I get pi, and, and uh, e to the i pi uh, is what you get uh, if you exchange two fermions. Uh, but then if you write it this way, you can have any other uh, value for nu, and for any other, people called it anion. So uh, if you didn't know uh, the origin of anions, it's the any uh, that uh, uh, is, uh, that's what started uh, the name. So such a case, uh, such a, a, 
uh, a superconductor, uh, which again I'm not I'm going not going to discuss the the uh, nature of the superconductivity in, in this state, only to say that the ground state uh, of the superconductor uh, was shown to break time reversal symmetry, and in fact break time reversal symmetry to order one. And I'll I'll, I'll uh, say in a minute uh, uh, what it means. Uh, it means that the effect is very very large. So uh, very early on, experiments were proposed, and you can see from the cast of characters that proposed these experiments uh, that this theory really captured the imagination of almost every, every theoretical uh, physicist. Um, uh, first experiment uh, to, uh, proposed, to be proposed were, was the uh, MUSR experiment, uh, in which you shoot a muon into that superconductor, and then you destroy locally superconductivity, or alternatively, uh, there are uh, impurities that, that, that destroy superconductivity and muon then comes, reside uh, in that site. So if superconductivity is destroyed, it is shown that there is going to be a local magnetic field. The muon will process in this local magnetic field. You'll get oscillations of this precession, uh, um, and then this is detected via the uh, positron uh, that is ejected, uh, and, and uh, you do the, the proper statistics, uh, and then determine what is the local magnetic field. And this is, it's not a very complicated calculation uh, to determine what should be that local magnetic field, and it was supposed to be very large. Um, of, uh, I think in, in the early calculations, it was supposed to be something of order of 100 Gauss or something like that, uh, easily detectable. Uh, by, by, by this method, okay? Um, so uh, that's uh, basically the, the... Now, um, the, the, uh, these experiments were done uh, and uh, um, in some materials uh, they were shown to exist, uh, strontium ruthenate, I'll talk about strontium ruthenate uh, later, uh, and then indeed there is a difference between above and below, uh, but in the cuprates, uh, there wasn't. Um, then uh, another experiment that was proposed uh, was a spontaneous Hall effect. Just like anomalous Hall effect in, in a magnetic material, uh, that is Hall effect without the application of magnetic field. Remember, Hall effect uh, is a hallmark of time reversal symmetry breaking. So uh, therefore, uh, uh, an anomalous Hall effect or spontaneous Hall effect means that time reversal symmetry is, is broken, just like in a magnetic material. Uh, such experiments uh, uh, failed uh, in, a, in a big way because uh, of, of misalignment. Remember, uh, in the normal way you measure Hall effect uh, is now with magnetic field. You apply the magnetic field, say, in the Z direction, uh, and you have uh, a current going, say, in the x direction, and you measure voltage between two leads in the y direction. Now, you have to prepare those leads, and you have to prepare them exactly to be uh, across from each other. You can never do that uh, in real life. There is always misalignment. Uh, and uh, this, uh, if you're trying to find a tiny effect, uh, as, as a large effect was not shown, uh, or was not found experimentally, uh, there is a problem. So uh, experiment, uh, this experiment failed because of misalignment and edge problems. Uh, also, the, if you take a, a small crystal or a film, the edges are, are really rough, and, and uh, this experiment becomes a mess. Well, actually, and I thought since uh, um, ex experiments are as, as important uh, in sorting uh, theories, uh, we decided to come back uh, to the issue of, of uh, Hall effect. So let me show you one way how you can measure the Hall effect uh, with absolutely uh, eliminating any uh, such misalignment and edge effect, okay? Um, so I'm pausing the, that. It is still time over asymmetry breaking, uh, and it can be applied to superconductors. So remember, uh, uh, the uh, Corbino, Corbino disk. So here is a Corbino disk. Uh, the gray is the material I want to measure, 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a very high conductivity material on the outside and the inside uh, and keep it at a constant potential. Let's say the outside at ground uh, and the inside uh, at some voltage V. So uh, if you remember your ENM, the electric field uh, is radial. And the radial electric field is the voltage divided by uh, the, the, I mean, there is this, this uh, uh, R is wherever, at any, at any radius R, this is the electric field. And the electric field in the phi direction all around is zero, right? That's symmetry. There is going to be a current, though, and it's only a radial current. I mean, there is a, 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 a uh, um, um, azimuthal. The, uh, it, it, it's not, I mean, if you connect it uh, through instruments, there is going to be current flowing. But let's say that right now I'm just putting it at a constant voltage without drawing current. Uh, then the only current flowing is a current going uh, um, uh, around, around the disk. Uh, you can easily calculate that this current density, so at any radius r, uh, is simply sigma xy. That's the off-diagonal term of the conductivity, therefore the, the whole conductivity, times the radial electric field. The radial electric field is what you put, because you put a voltage between the in and out. OK, uh, what this current does is it gives you a magnetic moment. Remember from before. The magnetic moment can easily be calculated when you integrate from the inner to the outer radius. Uh, and uh, therefore, you get, uh, uh, if you want, you can uh, relate this magnetic moment to an average current. Uh, and uh, just like in the uh, simple way I showed you uh, earlier, so you have a moment that is uh, proportional to the average current and to the area, average area enclosed by, by this loop. Now, if you remember your, your uh, multiple expansion in, in, uh, in uh, uh, ENM, I don't know, I don't remember which chapter in Jackson, uh, then for such an arrangement, the first moment that appears is the dipole moment. Therefore, you are only going to measure to first approximation just this moment. Well, this moment is not, does not have any contribution from longitudinal direction whatsoever. And therefore, you measure sigma xy period, nothing else. Uh, so here is a configuration. You simply, how do you measure it? Well, the easiest way is you take your, your uh, disk, you put it on a cantilever, and you look at the torque that is exerted on the cantilever uh, by a magnetic field. And if you have a spontaneous field, then you put a pure uh, parallel field in order to uh, produce the torque. And you are not sensitive. Uh, you, you are not contributing to the, to the perpendicular one. OK? So uh, that's some math. Uh, I have it because I'll put the slides on. You can see and check me. Uh, and you can calculate what is going to be the, the, uh, the moment. Um, and uh, this, if you look at the sensitivity of this apparatus, uh, then you can get sensitivity of sigma xy as low. Sigma xy, remember, it's not rho xy. In order to calculate rho xy, uh, you need to uh, 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 sigma xy divided by sigma xx squared. Uh, but believe me, uh, nobody ever measured such small sigma xy. Um, we, made, we made these cantilevers. Uh, that's the first generation. That's the important generation because that's the one that produces the data. Uh, there is a symmetry here. These are the leads that go to the, to the side. These are the leads that go to the center. Uh, this is showing how uh, we excite the cantilever. In fact, we excite it using radiation pressure. Uh, remember, you radiation pressure uh, is going to push the cantilever proportional to the power of the light. Uh, we can do that. Uh, it produces a very nice resonance. That's the first measurement with current uh, in one direction versus the other. And uh, we could calculate uh, what is uh, that whole current. OK, that's not the subject of this talk. Uh, but I just wanted to demonstrate yet again that uh, when there is a problem, you need to think about 
what, from the experimental point of view, what is the issue and how can I use symmetry, in particular symmetry, in order to mitigate that and de design a new type of experiment that will allow me uh, to measure something with uh, better, in a better way and better sensitivity. That was one example, but not the, the, the main one. I'll come to the main one. Okay, back to our topic. So um, I talked about um, mu, mu SR at the time, spontaneous Hall effect, but uh, then uh, there was uh, another proposal uh, by uh, uh, Xiaogang Wen and, and Tony Z uh, that, that uh, uh, said, well, uh, you know, basically we are talking about an effect that's, that should be very sim similar to, to magnetic, to magnetic uh, material. And therefore, magnetic materials uh, have uh, so-called magneto-optic effects. Uh, such as Kerr, Faraday, dichroism, etc. So let's calculate whether these anion superconductors also produce uh, such magneto-optic like effects. And they did. And they came up with an idea, and this is 89, uh, that indeed this effect can, uh, uh, I mean, should be there. And in fact, it should be uh, uh, there if anion superconductivity exists. This effect should be there of order one. Of order one uh, means that as strong as for normal ferromagnets, and I'll show you in a minute uh, what it means. So, um, um, so the, the uh, okay. So, uh, because I'm now introducing magneto-optics, uh, let me say a few things about it. Uh, magneto-optics, uh, it investigates the response uh, of a sample uh, that breaks time reversal symmetry to polarized light. And uh, it's important, I mean, it, it like, like Hall effect, uh, it measures, uh, should be uh, sigma xy, but now, because I'm using light at a finite frequency, it measures sigma xy uh, at a finite frequency omega. So most uh, optical measurements that you are familiar with uh, look at uh, sigma xy, uh, but, but, uh, uh, um, uh, the, the longitudinal part, if you want, that's the transverse part. Uh, in general, it's more difficult to measure. Uh, it can detect uh, magnetic effects, obviously. Uh, and uh, it appears to be, for example, if I'm looking at, at recent publications, I mean, recent uh, 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 current uh, uh, physics, uh, it, it, is a, it appears as a diagnostic for topological magneto electric effect, uh, uh, um, the, the, uh, in, in topological insulators, uh, et cetera. And as I'll show uh, soon, uh, it detects time over asymmetry effects in unconventional superconductors, and, and many more. So to remind you uh, uh, how does it work, uh, well, let's start with a classical picture. Uh, you, write, you write the equation of motion, the Lorentz force, for an electron that is moving with a velocity v in the presence of magnetic field b, a, a b and uh, it's going to uh, uh, go in a circular in a circular motion and if the uh, if you uh, look at the direction of the force you see that uh, depending on whether it moves uh, clockwise or counterclockwise uh, you get uh, you get uh, the the uh, a, a different force. So if you start with a circularly polarized light that is an electric field that is, has circular, this circular ele electric field, then depending whether it is uh, uh, counterclockwise or clockwise, uh, you are going to get uh, a different direction of the force, uh, which means that you get a different uh, direction a, different, a difference in, in the um, uh, conductivity for uh, right and left. This, this will represent the circular polarization, whether it's, whether it's right or left. Uh, and in turn, uh, if, if the conductivities are different, obviously the indices of refraction are different. Um, if you look at the quantum picture, then remember that a circularly polarized light uh, the circular polarization are 
equivalent to the photon spin, which is plus minus, plus minus one. So if you now look at uh, some transitions, you start from, say, L equal zero to L equal one, uh, then you, you split the LZ and then you split the M states, uh, then uh, uh, as they align like that, you see that uh, there are different allowed transitions for uh, right and left circularly polarized photons uh, in a way the same as if the photon has a plus or minus spin. So if you are at, at JZ of, of uh, plus one half, you are here, you can only go, you can only go to uh, three halves because you can only add one, uh, sorry, subtract one. Uh, and uh, um, if you add one, you go to the one half here. Uh, uh, and these are different transitions uh, for right and left. Again, this means that uh, you are going to get differences in the uh, optical conductivities, and you are going to get differences in the indices of refraction. OK, coming back to the equation of motion, now in the presence of an electric uh, and magnetic field, um, you can uh, then go through these equations. Uh, again, I'm sure you did it many times. I'm not going to uh, go too much on that. I just wanted it to be on on the slides, so uh, you'll have it uh, when I publish the, the slides. So you can calculate the polarizability uh, based uh, on, that, on that electric field. You put it back, you get the, the uh, displacement vector D, uh, which uh, can be written in terms of a dielectric function epsilon of omega. That's uh, a, a dielectric function is a function of frequency, and D is, of course, E plus 4 pi P the polarization. Now, the dielectric constant, constant can be written uh, in terms of the uh, frequency as 1 minus, uh, you can see here, uh, and you've done this many times, including calculating the plasma frequency, uh, again, skipping that. Um, but uh, the important thing is that um, if we add the magnetic field, right, uh, usually in, in your e and classes, I mean, you write that, but then you write uh, epsilon of omega. You forget about, you forget about the, that part, the magnetic field. You just go through that. You write the dielectric function as a function of frequency, and that's it. But if we now add the magnetic field, okay, um, in, in, in this way, um, then um, simply through the equation of motion, uh, then uh, it adds a term. We can rewrite it uh, in terms of, of uh, the, the electric field uh, with a new vector uh, G. G is called the gyrotropic vector. Um, and I mean, you see basically what I, what I do here, I exchange uh, E and, and H in the, in the cross term, uh, and then I can, I can write everything in terms of, of E, and, and then I give uh, F times H is, is G, writing it this way. Uh, and and uh, uh, so you see that in addition to the dielectric function, I have this new term, this gyrotropic uh, term. Now, uh, there is a comment here, which I don't have time to discuss, but I think it, it's, it's a very deep comment uh, that uh, I, I suggest all of you to go and look at it. It's mentioned. Uh, only in passing in Lauda Lifshitz, Lifshitz Electrodynamics of Continuous Media in the second edition. That's without Pitayevsky. Uh, and and uh, uh, there is a little bit of uh, more elaboration in the uh, paper of Persian from 67. Uh, you notice that, that everything I do here, I only involve the dielectric uh, constant as a function of frequency. I don't involve the the permeability as a function of frequency, right? I mean, the, there is also a magnetic field term. I apply uh, uh, light. I have an electric field and magnetic field, and I completely ignore that. Well, there is a very good reason uh, for that, uh, that, uh, that everything is shoved into the dielectric function, and I strongly suggest you guys to go and, and look at this, at this paper. In any event, uh, I go back uh, to, to the equations, and now I apply uh, an electric field uh, that, that uh, um, a plane wave type of, of an electric field. 
um, with k, the k vector uh, uh, describe the, the, the direction and the frequency. Um, and uh, I use the Maxwell equation, and, and I get that. Um, and now in the uh, uh, presence of this uh, um, um, uh, plane wave in, in, and using these equations, I can get an expression for the displacement uh, vector. Uh, and uh, n square is going to be uh, a, a, the, eigen, the eigenvalues of, of such vector, which I can calculate because I can rewrite this uh, vector equation uh, as, a, as a matrix equation, and, and then, and then uh, uh, the components are going to be given in terms of uh, ex, ey, ez, with n square uh, being, being the eigen the eigenvalues. I can calculate them. Again, I'm not going to go through the steps. Uh, but if you calculate them, uh, you find that uh, when diagonalizing, you get two values, uh, which are, uh, I, I will call them n plus minus. Obviously, these are going to be for right and left circularly polarized light, which are epsilon plus minus g, where g is this gyrotropic term I I uh, talked about, uh, I, I showed you uh, earlier. So uh, you see, in the, uh, if g does not exist, then n square uh, does not have uh, plus minus. It's, it's simply n square. And you remember that the, the dielectric, the, the index of refraction is just the square root of the dielectric function, right? So it's, it's, the, same, it's the same here. OK. Uh, now. Um, if you do some further manipulations for, for a plane wave, uh, you can uh, get that for uh, the x and y components of the uh, displacement vector. Uh, you can look at the uh, angle of rotation, which is just the ratio of them. Uh, you get this tange of, of this angle. And in the presence of G, uh, that, the, uh, that angle, the, tang the tangent of, of that angle, uh, is the tangent of the so-called Faraday angle. Okay? Uh, what is the Faraday angle, therefore? It's simply if you take a linearly polarized light and you go through a material, you get rotation of the polarization, and uh, the amount of rotation is this angle that I calculated here for, for a plane wave that is, that is linearly polarized. Um, so from here, I can calculate uh, where I go, z is now the thickness of the material because I'm going through the material. Uh, and therefore, uh, at z equal to l, that's the thickness of the material, I acquire uh, this component. And that's simply the real part of this, of this difference. You can check that what I wrote here is exactly, is exactly that. OK, so uh, for small angles, I can, I can expand it. And then what you get is that the Faraday angle uh, uh, is given in terms of the gyrotropic uh, piece, uh, which remember the gyrotropic piece was simply f times h uh, times omega uh, divided by square root of epsilon, which is the average index of refraction, right? Uh, and then the thickness of the material. OK. Um, there are further uh, manipulations uh, in order to connect it to the optical conductivity. But in general, uh, the dielectric function, if you remember, uh, is uh, 1 or epsilon infinity, if, if I have uh, other contributions, uh, that is a constant plus 4 pi i over omega times sigma. Right? That's, in general, the relation between the dielectric function and the conductivity. So, it continues to be the same relation now between the dielectric function for right and left circularly polarized light and uh, the uh, uh, optical conductivity for right and left circularly polarized light. Um, and now, um, uh, if I calculate these and, and I take the uh, very small gyrotropic, for example, very small magnetic field in the presence of magnetic field, uh, then I get uh, this relation that's uh, um, some index of refraction, uh, which is I can write in terms of real and imaginary part. And this is probably what you remember from your 
from your optics uh, classes. Uh, that the index of refraction has a real and imaginary part. But if you trace back uh, when you have these nodes, uh, you can see where it comes from. OK? All right. So if I now write the uh, tensor for the conductivity, uh, and, and let's say that uh, everything I do, say apply magnetic field, et cetera, will be in the z direction, uh, then the action is in the xy, and I'm going to measure uh, the xy of diagonal terms of the conductivity. These are the terms that tell me whether time reversal symmetry is broken or not. You can write it in terms of a, a, a right and left circularly polarized light, uh, which uh, in turn can be written in terms of sigma xx, that longitudinal conductivity plus minus uh, the off diagonal term, that's sigma xy. And then uh, if you further uh, continue, uh, you, you will get uh, the, you will get the, the uh, relation to the previous, to the n plus ik, as I showed before. Now, there is another phenomenon. Obviously, if I have linearly polarized light that I go through the material, I can also have a linearly polarized light that is reflected from a material. And let's assume first that the thickness of the material is larger than the optical penetration depth of the material. Um, I'm not sure. By the way, ask me questions or stop me, throw tomatoes, and they are, which, as you know, in Italy are very good, so I will not, I will not mind. Um, but, you know, I feel like I'm... So if there are any questions, please. Um, because I, I think I know this, so if... if uh, um, anyway, so... Uh, if I, I, I can do the same with, with uh, reflection, and uh, obviously uh, for thickness which is larger than the optical penetration depths, uh, then uh, uh, especially in, in uh, uh, normal incidence, I'm talking now about a different type of phenomenon, which is the Kerr effect. Now, for almost all the measurements that are relevant for these superconductors I'm going to talk about, it's the Kerr effect which is important. And the reason is that, you know, we are talking about bulk materials. People are making very small crystals, still much larger than the optical penetration depths. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar I mean, with, with numbers, but, uh, you know, for example, what's the, what's the optical penetration depths in the visible of aluminum? Anybody knows? Of gold. How much? Uh, it, it's, it's larger than nanometers, but uh, it's in the, in the right direction. What's the optical penetration depth of, of the cuprates, say? Uh, people are talking about or, or, or similar oxide superconductors. How is the optical penetration depth related to the Conductivity. Sorry? If the conductivity is? Yes. Yes. That's, in general, this is, this is correct. So the optical, the optical penetration depth goes like one over square root of the, of the conductivity, similarly with the frequency. Uh, but let's say we are talking about, about visible light. Um, for good metals, it's going to be of the order of, say, I don't know, 10 nanometers or so. ITCs and other oxides, it's 10 times larger. Okay? So it goes pretty deep into the material. So if I want to measure care effect, I need to be uh, at least uh, a few hundred nanometers, if not more. So typically thin films that people have been preparing of high quality, uh, they will be thinner than the optical penetration depths. Uh, but that's something to keep in mind. But I will talk about uh, mostly about crystals. Uh, so so uh, uh, these are of order of a few hundred microns at least. Uh, and therefore, we are safe uh, when we talk about the, the Kerr effect. So if the Faraday effect uh, was, was uh, 
simply the, the difference between the indices of refraction for right and left circularly polarized light, the Kerr effect uh, is uh, the imaginary part of the combination of these two. And we can show, and I, I'm not sure if I'll have enough time to go uh, uh, through it, uh, that, that this, the, the Kerr effect uh, is um, um, uh, if in the approximation of G, namely very small gyrotropic compared to the average dielectric uh, function uh, when it's small, uh, then it's basically just measuring the imaginary part of the, of, the, uh, of the diagonal term of the conductivity, or sigma xy of omega. So that's, that's actually very important. Uh, by the way, uh, if you didn't notice, then in, in the case of the Faraday, when, you are, uh, when g is much smaller than epsilon, uh, you mostly measure the real part. I think it was here somewhere. Yes, it's the real part. Uh, so so uh, our Faraday and Kerr angle uh, can be then related via kamers koning relations in that, in that limit. Okay, so uh, what do we conclude? We conclude that uh, when time reversal symmetry is broken, uh, then uh, we have uh, indices of refraction for right and left circularly polarized, polarized light that are different, and we can measure uh, one of these two effects, the Faraday effect where I go uh, through the material and look at the rotation of the polarization, uh, and uh, the care effect in which I uh, uh, go in, in, in reflection. Okay, so um, I want also to, um, I don't remember when I started. Okay, excellent. Okay. So, so uh, um, I, I want to now uh, talk a little bit more on the, the Kerr effect. Uh, Kerr effect has been now uh, very popular, uh, topological materials, people measure that. Uh, so I want to talk about the, the conditions for, for Kerr effect and, and Kerr effect uh, as measuring time over asymmetry breaking, okay? So um, we, in the presence of magnetic field, we have a finite, gyrotropic term, and, and, uh, uh, it, it's, it, and, and therefore uh, we have differences in the indices of refraction. We went through the steps, or you will go through them later when you look at the notes. Uh, so, okay, we understand that. But there is a question. Is the general requirement, uh, uh, if uh, uh, the gyrotropic term is non-zero, uh, also that the Kerr effect is non-zero. Because I showed you a gy gyrotropic term that originated for the from the magnetic field. There are other reasons for uh, other ways to generate gyrotropic terms. Uh, that is, for example, optical activity, chirality, quartz, if you didn't know, there is a direction uh, which uh, has, has chirality. Uh, in fact, uh, the rotation of the polarization of light uh, pa uh, passing through quartz uh, was, was uh, discovered, um, what, uh, 200 years ago by Arago. Uh, and uh, so people knew about chirality already back then. Uh, and uh, Louis Pasteur actually did experiments in which he showed uh, that, that if you use uh, circularly polarized light, uh, then uh, he can distinguish chirality of the same molecule, but with different, with different chiralities. Um, you know, sugar uh, is a chiral molecule. Uh, we are sensitive, uh, that is this kind of sensitive, to one chirality, uh, and people have been talking about producing sugar with the opposite chirality uh, that we, we will not digest. Um, there are uh, other molecules that appear in nature uh, with both chiralities, and, and uh, uh, Louis Pasteur was the first, in fact, um, um, uh, sodium ammonium uh, uh, tartrate uh, uh, was investigated by him, and he showed that there is, different, there is opposite chirality and that the index of refraction for them are not different, uh, are not uh, the same, it's different, okay? So obviously, if I now go back, I will say, well, there is a finite gyrotropic term. Will I be able to measure a Kerr effect? That's a question, right? 
So uh, as, we, as we said, the question is, is this enough for a curve effect? We show that, that time of asymmetry breaking produces n plus different than n minus. This, put, this in, in turn gives you curve effect. Now we go back. If these two are not equal, does it mean that we are going to have a finite uh, curve effect? Well, um, in fact, this is an issue that is an, it's a non-trivial issue that was uh, uh, even mentioned again in Landau Lifshitz. And for the younger people, unfortunately, uh, you are probably using the third edition. Uh, and in the third edition, uh, this is not treated properly. In fact, there is a mistake. In the second edition, which is my favorite edition, uh, that's, <laughs> that's the just Landau Lifshitz, uh, it already mentions uh, that there is an issue with what constitutive relation you use in order to calculate the care effect of, the, uh, of a material uh, that has uh, uh, opposite, opposite chirality and therefore, opposite, uh, and therefore uh, uh, different difference in the, in the indices of refraction of the dielectric function. In Landa Lifshitz, um, uh, the, the current version of electrodynamics of continuous media, uh, one starts with the, this, this uh, uh, constitutive relation. Constitutive relation actually relates uh, the, the, the electric field that you apply to the material with the electric displacement uh, that you are going to measure as a consequence of whatever is happening in the material. And then there is uh, this normal term of the, that's the dielectric function, that is pop the propor proportionality between the, the uh, displacement and the electric field. And then there is the second term, uh, in, uh, which can be written in this way. Remember, the E dx uh, is equivalent in Fourier space to k, so this is going to be something like uh, k with the electric field. Okay? So, uh, uh, just to show you uh, how deep is this issue uh, uh, on whether one should or not use this constitutive relation, in the early days of ITC, as this is part of what we are talking about today, uh, uh, Gorkov wrote a paper uh, in which, uh, after some results on care effect, uh, he, he used this equation to say that uh, the uh, finite effect that people measured uh, is probably coming uh, from chirality and not from time reversal symmetry breaking. So that's an issue. So let's, let's see the difference between these two effects. Okay? Now, as you know, uh, I can have a situation. So we are talking about circularly polarized light that goes through a chiral material. Let's take a screw. A screw is a representation of a chiral material. But as you know, uh, if you take a bolt, which is, say, a right, right-handed bolt, and you take uh, the, uh, the nut that goes through, then it doesn't matter from which side of the bolt you are screwing the nut. It will work either way. In other words, the, if, if the bolt is right hand uh, chiral, then it doesn't matter from which side you are looking at it, it stays right hand chiral. Right? Can you imagine that? Okay. But let's look at the magnetic material. The magnetization goes in one direction. Okay? That's like a magnetic field goes in one direction. An electron goes in one way or another is going to be very different. In other words, if I'm looking at the uh, now magnetic material from one side, and I can do it, for example, by allowing electrons to circle, they are going to circle in one direction. I will call it, say, right-handed. But if I'm looking at a magnetic material from the other side, and I shoot an electron now to go in, it's going to circle in the opposite direction. So this is like saying, oh, I can see a right-hand screw. This one says, I can see a left-hand screw. 
That's different than this. Both are, are chiral. This one does break time reversal symmetry. This one does not break, break time reversal symmetry. OK, I can now reflect light from either of these materials. OK, I apply an electric field, and I, uh, as a result, I get the electric displacement. OK, now, a very fundamental uh, issue in, in all these uh, uh, experiments is to remember that you need to respect uh, Onzager reciprocity. So let me remind you Onzager reciprocity when I do that. Onzager reciprocity basically says that uh, if I say have, I mean, usually it's used by, uh, mostly used in this form by electrical engineers who are looking at an antenna. Uh, you, you, you shine light from one end and you look at the antenna that picks it up and then you shine from the antenna side and you pick it up at the other. And basically, Onzager's reciprocity says is that you need to get the, the, same, the same thing. So let's write it uh, in terms of our, our uh, effect and response. The effect is the electric field. The response uh, is the electric displacement that I measure. That's after the interaction with the material. OK? So if I start with point one, I send the electric field, I get at point two uh, the electric displacement after the interaction here. Now I send from here, and then I get at point one the, the electric displacement. OK? So here um, I, I uh, uh, um, send and get here, and then the opposite here. And reciprocity says that the integral over all space of d1 dot e2 is the same as the integral over all space of d2 dot e1. This is Onzager reciprocity. OK? So I need to apply that. I always need to apply that uh, in order to see where the reciprocity, uh, I, I need to, uh, when reciprocity needs to be preserved. Yes? I don't need to, I mean, the, 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 uh, 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 I mean it's a thought experiment. Um, so I, I put the source here and the detector here, and then I exchange them, and I integrate over, over uh, all, all space, obviously over all time. Uh, there, is no, there is no time issue. I mean, actually, this is, this is a good point, because, because uh, uh, um, if you measure at finite times, and we can then negotiate what does it mean to be short time or long time, uh, then uh, reciprocity does not need to be preserved. Uh, in spin glasses, for example, um, you can, if you measure over short, short enough time, you will not have reciprocity, uh, simply because uh, the system is not equilibrated. Well, that just, just following uh, Onzager's uh, derivation. So, so the point is that if this is, if this is the condition, I think there is no argument that this is the condition for reciprocity, and reciprocity means that time over symmetry is preserved. So I'm using now the Landau and Lifshitz constitutive relation. I apply it here and here. That's OK. And I calculate. And what do I get? Well, I get an extra term. OK? I get that instead of getting this equal that, I get an extra term, which is here. And as you can see, uh, or, um, this term, which is ddxk of, of, of that, uh, it's, it can be written as a divergence of this piece. Again, you will, you will look at the notes later. Uh, and a divergence. Uh, a calculator over all space uh, is actually a surface integral. So it turned that the difference why they, they are not equal, they should have been equal. I, uh, by the way, I could uh, uh, also manipulate the other side and I would get the exact same thing. It would be divergence of E2 and uh, cross with this tensor, uh, gamma tensor times e, E1. It's the same. But 
The point is that I'm getting a surface integral. And this surface integral basically says that what I forgot with this constitutive relation is the fact that I have an interface, say, between vacuum and the material. And you cannot not include the interface in the calculation. OK? So this is actually very deep, uh, always being, being uh, uh, shoved under the rug, but uh, you, need, you need to understand that. Well, if you take that, that term, uh, then uh, you find that the correct constitutive relation is, is, uh, uh, is the one that we showed before, the one that appears in lambda leaf sheets, plus a different term uh, which takes care of the surface. It's, it's like saying that, that if, I, if, I, if I have a, a step function, okay, and the step function, let's say, is zero here and one here, okay, and then I want to go and reflect exactly from the wall that separates the zero and the one, I need to take care that the average between the zero and the one is one half in the middle. And this is exactly, this is kind of heuristic argument, but that's exactly why this one half appears here. So if you go through this calculation, uh, you can now correct the uh, section in lambda Lifshitz and find what is the correct uh, constitutive relation in the presence of time reverse asymmetry. Okay? Now, um, I'll go fast because uh, I want to be able to make some progress. Uh, I can now use scattering theory to calculate the care effect with the correct boundary condition, the correct constitutive relation. Uh, so I can define uh, then uh, uh, the state for light with a k vector going uh, in, uh, with, a, with a circularly, say, right circularly polarized light and then coming backwards with a right circularly polarized light. I, I can use two types of, of, uh, of uh, conventions, one in which the circular polarization is in the direction. I always measure it in the direction of propagation, and one which is fixed in space, and then I propagate in that. Uh, here I'm using the one that goes with the, with the light. So uh, I'm scattering light uh, from k, to, to, uh, k right to minus k right, and then k left minus k left. And then I can uh, use uh, that, uh, all that machinery to calculate uh, the transition amplitude using Green's function. You can uh, 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 do that or just go over the, over the, um, uh, the, the notes uh, to uh, then dis uh, 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 define uh, the reflection coefficient of right circularly goes back into right circularly and left circularly goes back to left circularly. OK? So these are these two. You can then show that the care angle is just the difference of the arguments of these two. And it uh, is uh, directly related to the, to the reciprocity. Um, again, th these are, I mean, if I'll spend time on that, it's, it's going to be uh, tedious and you'll probably lose me. But uh, you will be able to go over these uh, calculations and, and see uh, what it means. So uh, that is that uh, care effect. And it turned that uh, if indeed reciprocity is, is obeyed, like here, then, then the interaction term uh, has this form, uh, the, the transition amplitude has this form, and the transition amplitude for k right goes into minus k right is equal to k left goes into minus k left. Uh, that is, these two are the same, and therefore the care angle is 0. So if time reverse asymmetry is preserved, or if reciprocity, if I want to be more general, is preserved, then there is no care angle. So we are safe. Uh, we started with a care angle as a consequence of time reverse asymmetry breaking. And then we discover that there are materials that have different dielectric constant, uh, so, and, 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 sorry, different uh, 
uh, indices of refraction for right and left circularly polarized light. And then we were puzzled whether they will or not produce Kerr effect. Well, they will not. Because when time reverse asymmetry is preserved, Kerr effect is identically zero. However, if time reverse asymmetry is not preserved, I can show that that transition amplitude, and you'll just go uh, two slides back uh, at home when you look at it, uh, you'll find that these transition amplitudes are, are different, and these two uh, amplitudes of reflection are different, and therefore the Kerr effect is finite. So Kerr effect, therefore, as a, as a consequence, only measures breakdown of reciprocity. Time reverse asymmetry breaking is breakdown of reciprocity. Now, this is, okay, that, that, uh, that's just the summary uh, of, of that because uh, you can show that this expression goes into this expression, which I showed you first, which goes into this expression when the gyrotropy is small. Um, that's just a summary, but it's al always in the case of, of, uh, of time reverse asymmetry breaking. Okay, what about size of effect? I should stop. Uh, I'll, I'll just uh, finish here. So what about the size of the effect, the care effect? Well, here are two examples. Uh, strontium ruthenium O3 is an itinerant ferromagnet oxide, uh, similar to, to many of the oxides uh, that were discussed. Uh, um, in fact, it's uh, similar to, to some of the cuprates. Um, it, it is a ferromagnet below about 150 Kelvin. Uh, and as you can see, uh, by the time you get to low temperatures, it, the magnetization saturates and the care angle is about 10 milliradians. Okay? 10 milliradians, that 0 0.01 radian. This is enormous. Uh, iron, for example, uh, in photon energy of order of 1 EV, that's visible light, 1.5 visible light, uh, also about 10 milliradians. Doesn't matter uh, plus or minus, uh, we can talk about that. But it's a large effect, 0 0.01 radian. Uh, in some ferromagnet, it can, it can get all the way to 0.1 and maybe even more, okay? So let me just mention that at the time when this was proposed for anion superconductivity, immediately after, people measured effect of order 200 milliradians at Bell Labs, uh, in other places in the world. Um, so this is enormous. This is like a, ferromag like, like a very, very, very strong ferromagnet with very large spin orbit interaction, which is usually the way you couple uh, uh, to the magnetic, to the magnetic uh, uh, component. Uh, this, you know, like the world celebrated anion superconductivity. The problem is that a good experiment should reject all reciprocal effects, which these people failed to do. And we showed just before that care effect is finite only when reciprocity is broken. Okay? So you need to check whether you don't have any contamination by reciprocal effects. Uh, this is not very easy. Uh, you need to measure the absolute value of the care effect. You cannot use magnetic field to modulate the care effect in a superconductor because you apply magnetic field, you broke time reverse asymmetry, okay? And therefore, a cross polarization method, which is usually what people have been using, will not work, okay? So I will stop by just telling you that uh, in the way that we measured, and this is going, I'm going to start the, the second lecture with that, is uh, we invented a new apparatus. This apparatus is based on uh, a, a, a rotation, a, a, a fiber optic gyroscope. Okay? This is what is used. You know, there are fragments of such gyroscopes everywhere in Afghanistan and Iraq because uh, you can make them very compact, put them at the uh, uh, nose of, of missiles and, 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 and explode them, uh, these, these uh, fiber optic gyroscopes. Uh, so, uh, uh, and a gyroscope measures rotation. So I think this is the only experiment ever made in which an apparatus was calibrated using Earth rotation. 
This is the calibration of the apparatus that I'm going to discuss in the next lecture. It was calibrated using earth rotation. It's a 100 microradian, precisely calibrated. And then when the high temperature superconductors that were supposed to produce many milliradians, here I calibrated it at 100 microradian to within one microradian, if you want. This is zero. Showed nothing. OK? So despite the fact that the effect was found experimentally, we showed with this apparatus uh, that it does not. So the question is why, and I'll start the second lecture talking about that, and then move on to where we do, now using this apparatus, we do find effects and, uh, in, in uh, other unconventional superconductors. OK. Oh, questions, questions. Right?